Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome this time to the grave. Not what lies beyond it, but what used to lie in it. Safe in the peace of death. Unless the resurrectionists were abroad. Do you know what a resurrectionist is? Or was? Well, no matter. By the time this tale is told, you will. Not by me, but by the man who did tell it some hundred years ago. Let me introduce you to Cameron Fergus. <laughs> a glass of rum in heaven's name, landlord. It's cold enough in here to send a man to the grave. And a grave's no place to be. No place to be at all. Begin or end it all with the fact that I am a drunkard, an alcoholic. <laughs> I have been so ever since I can remember, 30 years or more. I do not like remembering. It's why I drink. There is no excuse for my existence. I am worth nothing to anybody except... Except I am afraid to die. Afraid to be laid fresh in the grave because I fear my body will not lie there in peace. No more than my soul. So I try only to stay alive and forget. There is no hope for me anywhere in this world or in the next. mystery drama, The Body Snatchers, was adapted from the Robert Louis Stevenson classic especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. The scene is a little pub in Debenham, England. Where is Debenham? It doesn't really matter. An isolated little town not far from London or this stream of life in general. There are a couple of public houses there, and the George is as good or as bad as the others. It just happens to be where Fergus drinks his five glasses of rum every night. A strange, bizarre figure that the town long ago accepted, or if you will, disregarded. But tonight is not an ordinary night in Debenham, as Ansa Mary, another habitué, is giving Fergus the latest news. <laughs> the squire himself, on his way to the new railway station, struck down as by the finger of God, as his carriage passed the old George here. They got him upstairs to the best room, and they telegraphed off to London with a great man's doctor. Oh, this is a night to remember. As it must to all men... I didn't mean that, Harry. God speed his doctor on the way. And to keep him out of the cold earth. Well, he's in a bad way. The landlord thought maybe you'd ever look at him. Me? Why me? Well, wouldn't be the first time you've shown your skill. <laughs> I remember the time old Maud Pringle dislocated her elbow. And Alfie Price's boy, Richard, broke his leg. You fixed him up real nice, you did. A simple fracture and an even simpler reduction. <laughs> Any farmer could have taken care of either. Well, not like you did. Not by a long shot. Wasn't you set out to be a doctor once? Or maybe even got to be one? Why don't you learn to mind your own business, Harry? Well, no offense, old chum. Most of them years we've been drinking together, and did I ever hold back anything from you? Some of us are by nature open. Others keep ourselves to ourselves. Not that anybody could ever say I had anything to hide. I sat there looking down to the bottom of my glass, swirling that last memory-drowning drink of rum, and thinking to myself the size of the lie I had just said. Oh, it had a kind of truth. Nobody in Debenham could say I had anything to hide. But I knew what black sins I had to hide from the world. And with enough liquor, even sometimes from myself. Well, listen to that, Fergus, will you? Eleven's is. And our innkeeper isn't here to chase us out at closing time. Too busy upstairs poking his big nose into the great doctor at work. <laughs> Trying to bring the old squire back to life. Not much chance of that, I'd say. You sneaked up and had a look, did you? Well, I tried. But no luck. Door shut fast. 
But I saw the squire on the way in before you got here. His face was all blown up like a balloon and red as one of them lobsters. How was his breathing? Well, when they brought him in, he wasn't breathing none at all. And then sudden, like he was, he was, but with a, a sort of rattle in his chest. After that, maybe a minute or so, he stopped again. Mm, chain stokes. What's that you say? Classic symptoms, apoplexy. Probably irreversible. The breathing pattern formalized as a syndrome by Dr. John Chain, a countryman of mine, and Dr. William Stokes, an Irishman by birth. A sure forerunner of cardiac failure. Hey, all them big words, you lost me. Did I? No matter. Your prognosis is probably as accurate as his physicians will be. If indeed the squire is not a corpse already. He gloomy one you are. I wonder now where they'd bury him. Who, the squire? Oh, we'd go right in the family crypt. In a crypt? <laughs> Above ground, then he should be safe enough. I wonder that I didn't see the doctor arrive. Did he come by train? Lord, no. You missed it, all right. Whipped right off the train into old George's cab. Hmm. I wonder how I missed the arrival. What did this great medico look like? Oh, he was, um, tall, white-haired. But he moved as brisk as a coat. Dressed in the finest broadcloth and white linen, great gold watch from studs and spectacles of the same precious metal. <laughs> And as there before the grace of God go. And what was the name of this paragon? This what? This man of undoubted success. Oh, McFarlane. Say that again. What, the name? McFarlane. Yes. No other name? Dr. Wolf McFarlane. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Fergus? You've broken the glass. Wasted the rum. Oh, and you've cut yourself. Never mind that. Wolf McFarlane. You sure of that? Well, it's how he introduced himself. Why, do you know him? Know him? <laughs> There's nobody knows him better than me. More's the pity. More is the pity and the shame. So the past I had shut out with some success and a great deal more wrong came flooding back. Pictures flashed across my mind in a kaleidoscope. Stop-action photographs of disembodied arms and heads the grisly jokes bedded about over the poor defenseless corpses that passed beneath our hands and were stripped barren by our razor-sharp knives. But it all might have been a bright dedication and a proud way of life, except for Wolf McFarlane and his kind. For every one of us, the end was the triumph. But the means, heaven help the few of us who has to face it. And then, suddenly... There were footsteps on the stairs coming down closer and closer to me and I was about to face the man who attempted me to sell my future. The man who could live with his vileness because he had no conscience and had left me to eke out my life dirty and despairing, afraid to do the only thing I really wanted to, to die. You're as white as a sheet, Fergus. Don't take on so. There might be two men with the same name. <laughs> My sincere condolences, but the squire was virtually a dead man from the moment the stroke hit him. Nothing could have saved him. That's him. That's his voice. Uh, forgive me for my abrupt leave-taking, but my coach is waiting and I cannot miss the train. Well, here he goes for the door. If you want to make sure you do know him, you better move fast. I, I must see him face to face. McFarlane. Yes? Toddy. All right. Toddy McFarlane. I'm afraid, sir, you have the better of me. I don't believe we are acquainted. Oh, we are acquainted, all right. Look close. I want you to recognize I've me. I've told you... Good Lord. Cameron. Cameron Fergus. Yes. Did you think I was dead, too? That we are all so easy shut of old acquaintance. Oh, hush, man. For the love of God, let the dead past bury itself. Not ours. Nothing stayed buried decently then, did it, Wolf? Oh, now, come, Cameron. We are both a little shaken at this chance encounter. I hardly knew you, I confess at first, but I am overjoyed. Overjoyed to have this opportunity. 
Unfortunately, I must not fail the train, so if you'll forgive me, I... Forgive you? I, uh... Well, I meant for running, but, uh... Yeah, uh... Well, let me see, uh... Oh, yes, of course, yes, yes, uh... You shall give me your address, and you can count on early news from me. Put away your gold pen and your false friendship. But I... I want to do something for you, Fergus. I can see... Forgive me that you are somewhat out at elbows... We must take care of that. Money? Well... Money from you? The money I had last from you is lying where I cast it in the rain and mud. What is the matter with you, Fergus? Now, what is it you want? I wish I knew. Revenge for Jeannie and the others. An accounting for the wasted rum-soaked derelict you made me. I thought long ago the hand of God, like the squire upstairs, must have struck you down... Perhaps I was appointed now, for Fergus, that. Fergus, Cameron, I beg of you. You've been drinking and you are not in your right mind. Now, don't do anything. What is that you have in your hand? Don't you remember? Jeannie's. Jeannie's hat pin. The one you gave her. Would it not be poetic in God's justice to drive it into your throat, up slanting through the mouth till it lodged in the brain? Or between the fifth and sixth ribs, driven straight into your black heart. Right, help! Have you got out of your mind? Help! Dear Fergus, take it easy. Help me. Stay help out me. of this, Harry. But you, you... If you value your life, stay back. Don't, 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 don't. don't. You, you, you can't kill me, Fergus. You... Oh, you're right, I can't. I should, but I can't. Get out of my sight. Catch your train. Go. Whip <laughs> up the horses. We want to take that train. Lord above, Fergus, what got into you? Put that long hat pin away. That's a dangerous instrument. More like one of them Italian stilettos. It was genies. Yes, yes, sure it was. Some pretty sparklers, all right. Must have cost a pretty penny, too, but let's put it away and, and sit down and have a nice little snort for the road, eh? Yes, yes, drink. Get me drunk. Wipe it out, the past, the past. Let me sleep. And oh, oh, if only I could never wake again. Yes, yes, right as rain, old chum. Yeah, just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> that, that, that's a funny one, all right. With all the doctors around this night, like the gentleman who just left. Don't call him gentleman. Oh, well, I mean, when a man's become a doctor... No matter what he thinks he's become, the devil is what he began. A resurrectionist he began, and in his heart, that's the way he'll die. A resurrectionist... It's a profession that flourished in the early 19th century. Profession, did I say? It was rather a crime. The more familiar names are ghoul, grave robber, body snatcher, the conscienceless night people who provided cadavers for the medical schools, the cold-blooded legion of the damned who, if a corpse was not to be found, provided a fresh one from the living I'll return shortly with Act Two. In one of the greatest speeches in the English-speaking theater, Hamlet, the tortured prince of Denmark, wrestled with the problem to be or not to be and came to the conclusion that conscience doth make cowards of us all. Cameron Fergus, though far less innocent than the tragic Dane, as a young man found himself caught in the same wedge. But when he made his decision, he found not death, but a life of remorse and dishonor. I was the only child of two elderly parents. By my early twenties, they were both gone, leaving me a small but comfortable income. Even in those days, I already considered myself a man about town. But my vices were minor, and inside I had a craving for something more fulfilling in life. Both those lacks were satisfied when I fell under the spell of Wolf McFarlane. We met first at the house of Jeannie McRoberts, 
a young woman who epitomized everything pure and sweet to me, and whom I secretly hoped to marry one day. Oh, Jean Lee, this music's too slow. It's romantic. Well, maybe that's what I meant. Let's sneak out for a walk in the garden. Oh, no. It's not the music that's too slow for you, Cameron. Oh, let's suppose it was. I wouldn't trust you out there all alone. You walked out with him. Who? The tall one there, dancing with Maggie Dyack. Wolf McFarlane. Well, it's the first time he's our guest, and besides, it was still twilight then. He's a dandy, all right. And he has all of you girls making eyes at him. Where's he from? Oh, uh, Glasgow, I think. Uh, he's here in his second or third year as a medical student, working under Dr. Knight. I suppose he's turned your head, too, huh? Hmm? <laughs> he did when we danced. Oh. What could be more exciting than being a doctor anyway? Someone who can make you well if you're ill. Well, maybe I'd better consider taking up the profession myself. So I won't lose you. So, Cameron, you have a taste for being a doctor, eh? I can think of no higher calling. Well, that's flattering. Have you the talent for it? I stood high in my class at the university. Oh, you have a brain all right, I've no doubt. At least so Miss McRoberts informed me. Did she now? But when I spoke of being a doctor in talent, I meant other things. Such as? Have you a strong stomach? Can you stand the sight of blood? I wouldn't turn from it. Have you the nerves of steel? I don't exactly know what you mean. Could you take a scalpel and split a man or a woman from breastbone to pubis with a steady hand? Could you open the stomach and cut out a diseased organ? Could you amputate a leg or an arm? I... I'm not exactly sure it was being a surgeon I had in mind. Oh, never mind the live bodies, lad. It's the dead ones you have to cut through first. There's no other way to learn anatomy firsthand, and uh, not all of them are fresh from the grave. What does that mean? You'll find out for yourself. How are your scruples? I think you're just having fun with me. I'm sorry I asked. I don't need you to further my ambition. There are other ways. Oh, nay, nay, nay. Hold, lad, don't be so hot-tempered. <laughs> I was pulling your leg a little, but less than you might think. And you do need me more than you think. Why? My recommendation to the doctor in charge of the medical school, as it happens, would open the doors for you like that. Would you give it to me? I just might. In exchange for something. What? The rest of your waltzes with Miss Jeannie. She's the only girl here with any grace or style. Like a feather in the wind. And I love to dance. Is it a bargain? It's the one I can't control. It's Jeannie who says who she'll dance with. But if you ask her and tell her why? I'll tell her on one condition. And what is that? That she saves the last one for me. Well, I can hardly blame you. And if we are to be friend and colleagues, why should I be greedy, eh? <laughs> Shake hands on the bargain. Shake. Ha. To a long and close future together, Fergus. We can use a man like you. I take that as a compliment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That I should ever have seen the day I thanked the man I have spent my life cursing and reviling. What an innocent I was. I kept my part of our bargain in my naivete and excitement, not noticing that Jeannie's reluctance to change her dance card was neither long nor strong. My head was spinning too much with other future dreams, that I was to become a doctor. For Wolf McFarlane kept his part of the bargain, too. So, Wolf, this is the young man you've spoken so highly of. Only because he deserves the recommendation, Dr. Kirk. He's a man we can use in more ways than one. Splendid, splendid. We're always in need of recruits, Mr. Fergus. Wolf here tells me you are a young man with a fine taste for a night of romping and wake up bright-eyed and clear-headed of a morning with no hangover, neither physical or mental. <laughs> well, that makes us three of a kind. And that's what it takes to make a mark in our profession, lad. Stamina. Staying power. We have to do many things that would make an ordinary mortal's blood run cold. If you'll try me, sir, I don't think you'll find me wanting. 
Well spoken, Cameron Fergus. I like you. Uh, what do you say, Wolf? Shall we make him one of us? My vote is aye. Well, then so is mine. I leave it up to you to initiate him into the mysteries and secrets of his new profession. But softly, slowly, mind you. We can't scare him off till he's well hooked, eh? <laughs> we must show the best side before he sees the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you're very kind, Dr. Kirk, but I know you're only testing my resolve. How could so noble a profession have a bad side? Well, Dr. Kirk meant only, I'm sure, that it has a difficult side. No, to be sure, to be sure. No prize worth winning can easily be come by. Work hard, and let Wolf here help you over the rough spots. <laughs> For my money, you couldn't have a finer guide. <laughs> a finer guide, that much was true. A guide to hell and damnation. But I'd never have realized it then. Wolf was my friend, mentor, and convivial partner. I found that I was a natural doctor, nay, more than that, perhaps a surgeon. But in that field of medicine lay all the seeds of disaster. For to study anatomy, one needs a body, and you cannot practice on a live one. I was not so innocent that I didn't know the answer to that. But it was not till the end of my first year, when I moved in with Wolf, that I had to face it. Oh, uh, uh, Wolf! Wolf, wake up. Mm, what? <coughs> Never, dog. What hour is it? <coughs> it wants ten to three. And you wake me? Damn it, Fergus. Someone at the door. Oh, of course. Reason I bid you move in tonight. Oh, get dressed while I answer that. But what is... Don't, don't ask questions. Do as I say. Governor. I was off that oh, no, 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 Sorry for the delay. Just give me a moment or two, eh? We have a real load tonight. We'll need help. Oh, don't worry. We have it. Meet uh, us at the usual place, eh? Oh, check me my trousers there, Cameron. What is it? Do I have to spell it out? The Resurrectionists. And tonight they have a cart full. Tonight is your baptism. You going to let me down? Enough in hindsight to know what I should have answered to that. But I was young, and I thought he was my friend. And so, half dressed, half sober, half anesthetized, we went to the building that housed the dissecting lab and began the nights, or I should say, the early mornings were. All right, put it down. There we are. Is that the last? Uh, not tonight. One more. Fine. Before you bring it up, let me introduce you to Dr. Cameron Fergus. Well, how do you do? Um, the uh, 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 gentleman prefers to leave his name out of these transactions. Just call him Digger. <laughs> That's me, by nature and profession. When you bring the last one up, Dr. Fergus will pay you. The usual tariff. Now, Fergus, I'm going to have to leave you in charge. Why did you call me doctor when I'm not even... You've got a lot to learn. We need the title to keep these fellows in hand. What do you mean? I'll explain it to you soon. Now, first off, here is a key. It unlocks the safe there. Now, there's money, cash in there, and I'll tell you just how much to disperse. But be sure the safe is securely locked before these ruffians return. Now, I have to get to Dr. Kirk right away and tell him what luck we've had tonight. He'll want to make arrangements for dissecting in anatomy classes tomorrow. It seems strange. Potter's field death rate was so high this one night. In this part of our business, it is well to question as little as possible. I followed the easy path to do as I was told. To suspend thinking, pay off the grave robbers, and twine myself irrevocably in a practice which, no matter how we as doctors might believe its morality, in those days could involve death by hanging. But if I thought of it much, after the body snatchers were come and gone and paid, it was all forgotten when Dr. Kirk joined us. <laughs> A magnificent day in our lives, gentlemen. I congratulate you both for your part in this. While at the same time, I need not enjoin you to the secrecy we must maintain. 
My congratulations for tonight and carry on the good work, gentlemen. I bid you good morning. Hmm. High words, Dr. Kirk. And we are left with all the dirty work. What do you mean? The time has really come for you to stop asking the very answerable question. In the name of medicine and research, we gather bodies, right? But that is no crime. Using already dead flesh, which can render up to us secrets of how to handle living flesh, is not a valid crime. On that basis, you have an argument. If the flesh is already moribund, but body snatching is a rewarding crime. And if there is no dead body to snatch, with the kind of man who plies this trade, do you think he would hesitate to wait for the flesh to die if his source of supply ran low? Oh! Good Lord, what do you say? Oh, don't pretend innocence. If your conscious brain will not admit the truth, your subconscious one knows it. And you signed for the bodies tonight. Willy-nilly, you are with us from here on in. With us from here on in. For the first time, I realized I was trapped. For a moment, I even thought my friends had made use of me. But then I thrust that thought aside. They were pioneers, like myself, taking the only means to great ends. And if indeed it were true that an occasional body had not met a natural death, why, by all reason, it could only be someone who was a criminal, who had sought it himself. So I reasoned. And with another drink of fiery scotch to soothe my addled brains, soothed my burning conscience. This would be the end of all connection with the resurrection men, I swore. Not knowing how devastatingly empty the oath I took was destined to be. Poor Cameron Fergus. Lulled into the crime of accessory after the fact. Controlled by men wiser in the ways of vice than he. Who would soon involve him as accessory before the fact. And even worse, I'll return shortly with Act Three. Most doctors of those days were not about to be troubled by the material they dissected. Only the few who trafficked in procuring the illegal material were involved in matters of conscience. And most of them, sad to say found rich enough rewards to still what small worm of morality might squirm within their hearts. The resurrectionists were well paid, and the men who bought the dreadful merchandise each made their own defenses. But I lean on you and Wolf Cameron boy. You're my right and left arms. A constant supply of cadavers is the prime necessity of the school. I know, but where they come <laughs> from is... My boy, that's no question for us. They bring the body, we pay the price. Quid pro quo, as they say in the Latin tag. But, sir... Let's I... have no more buts, Fergus. And no questions. For conscience sake. But that's exactly the problem, sir. I watch these ruffians come in before the dawn, in the dead of night... And I cannot help but be struck by the hangdog looks, their eyes averted. I want to have no part of it, sir. If you expect to stay here and achieve your degree, I tell you, you must be part of it. I'm sorry to be so blunt, Fergus, but that's the way it is. And I have no further time to talk to you. Wolf, help me. We are condoning, nay, even promulgating murder. Fergus, you think too much. Accept your duty and concentrate on learning to be a doctor, not a policeman. And what is my duty? Take what is brought, pay the price, and avert your eyes from the evidence of any crime. What decisions I might have made in my first revulsion, I'll never know. For at that time, Jeannie came back. And the renewal of our acquaintance put everything else out of my head. She was fascinated about my future as a doctor, the future of all of us. I'd rather have you tell me about Paris and Rome. Oh, that's all for the future. What I want to know about is the present. 
How soon will you be a doctor? I'm afraid that takes a little time. And Dr. McFarland, how is he? Well, though he's nearer it than me, doctor is still a courtesy title. I wish you'd tell me all about your life, <laughs> lives, and what they're like. It's not a subject for a girl. Well, Wolf McFarland didn't mind talking about it. Well, that's his business. If you'd prefer and him... And don't to... be a silly boy. And don't be jealous. I'm only interested because he's become your friend. The more fool I that I thought he was. He'd already been a beginning. But now he was to be the cause of my complete downfall. It happened so casually. One afternoon after work in the lab... I dropped into a neighborhood tavern to meet Wolf sitting with a small, pale man. Dark eyes, very close together, seemingly refined at the start, but to reveal himself later as coarse, vulgar, and vicious. <laughs> the tales I could tell you about our old friend Toddy here. <laughs> Toddy? Sure. Toddy McFarlane. What? Has he kept his nickname secret from all of you? It seems so. Why toddy? <laughs> because every time we pulled off a rough one, we drink a toddy to our trickiness. Hey, toddy? I <laughs> wish you wouldn't call me that. Drink up and enjoy the good living it brings all of us. Oh, for God's sakes, watch your mouth. <laughs> well, now, will you listen to our preacher? Pay no attention to him, Cameron. Is that your given name? Yes, but... Uh... I may be a pretty bad fellow myself, but toddy here, toddy McFarlane... Could put us all to shame. <laughs> Here, look, have a look at him. It looks could kill. Toddy hates me because I know too much about him. I told you don't call me that confounded... I'll man. call you as I please. And what can you do to keep my mouth shut, Toddy? <laughs> Just look at him, Cameron Fergus. Did you ever see the lads play knife? He'd like to do that. All over my body... We medicals have a better way than that. When we dislike a dead friend of ours, we dissect him. Why I made that stupid, ugly joke, I'll never know. I longed to snatch the words back the moment they were said. Would to God I could have. I was to regret them the rest of my life. I should have admitted before this that I was well paid for my work of receiving nocturnal corpses. No questions asked. It was three nights after I had met Gray, and I was on duty at the empty dissecting rooms when... Come on, Fergus. Damn it, man. Would you have me caught red-handed? Wolf, what are you doing here at this hour? Shh, shh, shh. Ask no questions. I have some merchandise in the gig. Help me in with it. It was a small enough figure wrapped in a winding sheet. And it was no job for the two of us to bring him in and stretch him on a table. But for some reason, Wolf McFarlane was breathing as heavy as if we had lifted a horse. All right. All right, sealed and delivered. Let's have it signed. What? Get to the safe. I want you to pay me and give me the receipt. Since when did you turn resurrectionist? We're short of bodies, are we not? Nothing for the class to start on tomorrow? Come on, come on. Let's get the transaction over with. Patience, man. We've the rest of the night. And your friend is in no hurry anymore. Sign the paper and give it to me. Well, don't you want the money first? The paper. All right. My signature for posterity. And for me, this is all I need. And the money. My present to you, old chum. The finder's fee, too. You've been working too hard as it is. A man ought to have some reward. Why don't you take my rig and slip on home? I'll cover for you for the rest of the night. It's late enough for both of us to leave. Oh, I think I'll stay. Pray to sec the derelict there. Ready to pass around to our eager students when they arrive. McNeil's working on the lower extremities. Sharples is screaming for a liver. What's the matter with you? You seem unnerved. Who in... No, 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 don't take that cheat away, don't. Very well. You had to know... Now you know why I had to have your signature of acceptance. It's Gray. The man who... A man who could have ruined all of us. We're in this boat, sink or swim. Would you want your neck on the gallows like Burke? This man is dead. And is valuable to the advancement of medicine. Accept the fact of his death. Never question the how. You're one of us still, young Fergus. Forever. 
so I was already trapped. I began a long lifetime of drinking in earnest. I was neither surprised nor that much affected when Jeannie turned from me. Even the fact that I heard by the grapevine, certainly not from his lips, that Wolf was squiring her about failed to rouse me. I felt myself damned forever. I wasn't good enough for her. But youth is resilient, and once I had digested my involvement, I learned to live with it. Even thought to go back to Jeannie again. As it happened, I chose accidentally the day that Wolf was to receive his sheepskin as a doctor. I never realized what real love was until I met Wolf. Puppy love, real love. Would you like me to tell you about this man you worship so? What he's really like? Don't be so silly and jealous. I'm not thinking of myself, Jeannie. It's you. I want to protect I you from... I'm quite old enough to handle my own affairs. Well, I doubt that. You couldn't understand a man like Wolf. Take your hands off me. Damn it, if I have to shake some sense into that lovely head, I'll do it with my hands. If I can't with words... Fergus! You ghastly dog! Fergus! Fergus, have you lost your mind? I'm trying to save her from you. Well, get your hands off her, you little fool. Oh, leave me go. If you insist, remember, you asked for it. Oh, you didn't hurt him, Wolf. I imagine I did. He'll have a sore jaw tomorrow. As sore as my head. But what else could I do? Well, nothing else. I don't ever want to see Fergus anymore. I wasn't unconscious. I could hear all of this. And I thought at that moment that life could scarcely deal with me more harshly. Fool that I was with the worst yet to come. Special delivery tonight, Fergus, me boy. Five. Douse the light till we trail him in. And come ahead. Stack him where you will. I wouldn't care if Queen Victoria was one of them. I've had my fill of this job. Nobody likes it much, but it's a living, as we say in the trade. <laughs> Might as well get something from the dead. I went about my business mechanically, mind drugged by liquor, body reacting out of sheer habit, and then... A horror of horrors looked up at me from the dissecting table. Her blue eyes open, staring with a startled horror that she could come to this. Jeannie. Jeannie McRoberts. A candidate for the cold-blooded dissection. Candidate for jokes and the discard by the morrow's crew of medical students. Jeannie. I'm just as horrified as you, Fergus. She died no natural death. There were marks of violence on her. Possible strangling. But why? I can't tell you why, or guess at least. She was pregnant. She was carrying a child. How do you know? Dr. Kirk was with us first thing in the morning. Everyone attends dissections. Jeannie was with child. Do you suppose she killed herself? You know she didn't. Jeannie was murdered. I'm not going to let her die unrevenged. You're not suggesting I had anything to do with it. Exactly. I'd reconsider that statement if I were you. Oh. If anyone did kill her, and mind you, I'm not saying they did. You would be the logical suspect. Oh, she I... did spurn you. Yes, but let me remind you about the bodies that you've received for dissection and signed for. Many of which you must have known died not natural deaths. Gray, for example. You want to place any necks in the noose? Go ahead. But give first a care to your own, my lad. I warned you when you began this business. You should be without a conscience. He knew me too well, Harry. Conscience I had, but no courage. You mean that, that distinguished doctor who just left m murdered the girl? Why not? An obscure Scottish girl he could never have married since his ambitions reached so high. Well, I'll tell you something. Man to man, I I'm surprised you didn't kill him right out of hand. If your story be true. Oh, the story is true right enough. And the proof of it all is that I didn't. Here, finish your drink, old chap. Thanks. <laughs> oh, strong enough. False courage, maybe. I never had the real thing. 
Else none of all of this would have happened. Well, at least you had some conscience. Which finally has caught up with me. <gasps> hey, what have you done? Jimmy's hatpin. The weapon of remorse. Oh, good almighty, Fergus. You drove the hatpin straight into your heart. Here, let me help. By all means. <gasps> pull it out, Harry. Oh. Don't hesitate. Pull it out. Good now. Grit your teeth now. There. Oh. Now that'll be better. Don't you believe it? Only thing might have saved me was to leave it there. <laughs> now I'm sure to die. One thing at least I did right in my life. Just that... Do me one favor, Harry. What's that? I've enough money... See me buried above ground in a strong, tight crypt. Don't let me be had at the last by the body snatchers. Wherever I go, let me go whole and accept my judgment. Whatever it is. Oh. <laughs> curious and chilling story with no moral that I or any man can quite offer. The raw material for the study of medicine that today has prolonged life by almost twice as much as could be expected in the last century is no longer needed so much. Thank heaven the ghoul, the body snatcher and the resurrectionist man have passed from our lives or deaths since that was their concern. I'll be back shortly. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>